Hi, this is the third TLK exhibition sample from Semantic Education. And as usual, I'm going to walk you through the selection of the three objects and the thinking process behind it. And in this third video, I'm going to try uh, a new approach to creating the exhibition. Just a reminder that the requirements of the TOK uh, exhibition, for the exhibition students must do the following. They must select three real-world objects. They must link them to one of the 35 knowledge questions that are given in the guide, also called the IA prompts. And they must write a commentary of up to 950 words uh, on all these objects combined. The commentary for each object must include an identification of the object and its specific real-world context, an explanation of the link between the object and the IA prompt, and the justification of the inclusion of the object in the exhibition. Uh, these requirements are briefly summarized in our video called What is the TOK Exhibition? It's on our YouTube channel. If you haven't watched it yet, do check it out. Uh, so, as I said, this is the third TOK exhibition sample in our, in our series. And in these videos, my purpose is to try and demonstrate not just the final product, a sample TOK exhibition, but the whole process that goes into the creation of this product, uh, so that students can follow and uh, reproduce this thinking process if they want. In the first video, I started with a prompt and I worked my way down to the specific objects. I called this the top-down process. In my second video, I tried the opposite approach, a bottom-up approach. I started with an object, and then I tried finding a prompt that best fits into the object. In this third video, I was thinking about what other approach I can take, and uh, I will start with a theme this time, and even uh, more specific than that, I will start with a particular topic particular lesson topic within a theme. Then I will try to find an interesting object, and then I will try to look for a prompt that is suitable for it. Uh, so the, an overview of the first two exhibitions is given here. If you haven't watched the first two, please do check them out. Some starting points. Um, I want to narrow down my search by starting with a particular lesson topic that I found interesting. From there, I will use the bottom-up approach to kind of select an object first without thinking about which IA prompt it's most suitable for. Once an interesting object is selected, I'm going to try and find uh, the knowledge question that uh, can be used for it. After that, I will just see how it goes. I will select the first object, I will link it to the knowledge question, and then I will see how it works out, where my reasoning takes me. Uh, remember that whatever objects you select, I, the IB is really adamant about objects being something specific embedded in a specific real-life context rather than a generic object. As they write in the guide, a generic teddy bear is not okay, but a, teddy, a specific teddy bear that you had as a toy in your childhood and that you grew emotionally attached to is better because it has a personal context around it. So let's go, go over to the key task, selecting the first object, which seems to be the most difficult step in this whole process. Um, I'm thinking back about what we did in class, imagining I'm a student. Um, suppose I find it extremely difficult to choose from an unrestricted array of objects. The world is just too big for me to choose from, and I feel overwhelmed. So to narrow down my choice, I'm thinking, why don't I start with something that we discussed in class and I found pretty interesting, so I could just use that as my starting point. Um, thankfully, my lessons were full of interesting examples, and of course, I'm not going to just simply take one of these examples and use, I'm not going to use a textbook example, but I'm going to use that example as an inspiration for me to find something similar, or, or, as, an, or as an inspiration for me to enhance my thinking process. So what did we do in class? I randomly remember one of our lessons. Uh, I leaf through the textbook and select a lesson entitled Redefinition of Art. That's lesson 14 in unit 2 in our textbook. Um, the unit itself is on knowledge and technology, but if you know our textbook, it's built thematically, which means that 
uh, areas of knowledge are taught through themes rather than separately from them. So we apply knowledge and technology to natural sciences, knowledge and technology in human sciences, knowledge and technology in, human, in history, and so on and so forth. So this particular lesson is one of the lessons exploring knowledge and technology in the arts, and in particular the focus is on digital art. Um, in that lesson, uh, an example that was brought up is Harry Potter and the portrait of what looked like a large pile of ash. If you haven't read this wonderful chapter yet, it's, uh, it's highly recommended that you go ahead and read it. It is an AI-generated chapter of Harry Potter produced by the tech company Botnik Studios. I will put a link to the company and to the chapter itself in the description under this video. Uh, essentially, they had an algorithm that, that was trained on all seven of uh, Rowling's Harry Potter books, and it imitated her style of writing, her style of constructing sentences, the choice of words, and when the algorithm learned from uh, her seven books, it produced a text of its own, which, is, which took the form of this additional chapter. I read it, and it's quite hilarious. Uh, sometimes it's very thoughtful, sometimes it's very insightful, sometimes it's borderline ridiculous, but it's definitely worth a read. Um, so I like this example very, very well, very much, and I'm thinking it's just interesting. It could, it could make a good object for one of my objects in the exhibition. But obviously I can't just take uh, the textbook example as it is and just go with it. Um, I need to use that as an inspiration and find something else. But I know that I was so impressed by this AI produced chapter that I started looking for more examples of uh, literature produced by artificial intelligence. And I found many other things on online. And among these things, I stumbled upon the website called botpoets.com. Um, again, a highly recommended uh, destination. Uh, essentially, the website is a competition between humans and machines in writing poetry. In other words, a, a Turing test for poetry. Uh, you need to read a bunch of poems and for each one decide what or not. In other words, you need to decide if the poem was written by a human or by a machine. And the idea is that if you can't do it successfully, then you lost and the machines have, have passed the Turing test. So they give you 10 poems, and if you, um, if you fail to uh, correctly identify uh, at least half of them as written by a human being, then the conclusion is that you can't tell the difference between a human-generated poem and a machine-generated poem, which means that poetry that machines generate is indistinguishable from whatever poetry we humans generate, which is a big deal. One of the poems that I found there, number 6 of 10, it's really not important which one to take, but this particular one I found quite tricky. I thought it was written by a human, but it turns out it is written by a machine. So this particular poem was one of the poems that, that managed to fool me. It's a screenshot from the website botpoem.com. And I do invite you to go to the website and take the whole test and see for yourself if you can, if you can pass it or not or rather if the machines can pass it. So uh, the object seems interesting. I can use that as the first object in my exhibition, but I still don't have a prompt. So I need to scan the list of 35 IA prompts and see if there's anything that's suitable and that will fit my object nicely. I start looking at the list and it feels like the best candidate is this one. How important are material tools in the production or acquisition of knowledge? I can argue, using this particular example, that poetry is one form of knowledge. And, um, well, according to one of the viewpoints, so a work of art in itself contains some form of knowledge. So the poem in itself uh, bears some sort of knowledge, we can claim. And if poetry is a form of knowledge, indeed, then this form of knowledge is often argued to be inherently human. Only we humans can produce that kind of knowledge. So indeed, if poetry is a form of knowledge, and if computers can produce poetry that is indistinguishable from that of humans, then we can argue that computers have 
become very important in producing knowledge. So it does link to the prompt in this way, how important are material tools in the production of knowledge. If, if a poem is a form of knowledge, and writing a poem counts, uh, counts as production of knowledge, the poem was written by a computer algorithm, which is a material tool, and it shows how important they are, because at this point they're so good that we can't even uh, tell computer-generated poetry from human-generated poetry at all times. So important that computers are taking over the human territory, it seems. You're taking over something that has been considered to be inherently human for a long time. So there we go, it will become my first object. Uh, it's an IA-generated poem called A Sound, one of the ten poems participating in the Bot or Not competition on botpoet.com. And the real-world context is that this website is a Turing test for poetry, and that I have failed this test, and to my surprise, I, I have taken this test, and from, to my surprise, I have failed it. How does my object link to the prompt? Well, I can say that poetry is traditionally thought of as a human territory, and the only tool involved in its creation, traditionally, was supposed to be the human soul. But this particular poem looks very much like human creation, which shows that material tools, such as computer algorithms and AI, are becoming so important that they're starting to take over human territory and knowledge. And finally, how do I justify the inclusion of that object in my exhibition? Well, I included this because it makes a very strong claim. It makes the claim that material tools are very important because they can replace humans, even in such form of forms of knowledge as poetry. Done. Let's go over to the second object. Um, I'm looking at uh, this uh, excerpt from the uh, GOK exhibition assessment instrument, and I'm looking at these highlighted words in particular. There's a strong justification of the particular contribution that each individual object makes to the exhibition for the highest mark value. It suggests to me that um, since each individual object makes a particular contribution to the exhibition, I can't really select the second object in a way that will repeat the same kind of idea that has already been conveyed by my first object. I should probably be selecting the, the second object with the aim to develop the message, not just to find another example similar to my first example to illustrate the same kind of point. Although that would be the easy way out, uh, I don't want to go along that route. I want to take an object from some other walk of life. So I'm thinking, what have I talked about so far? I talked about poetry as a form of knowledge, and I don't know what, what terms are attached to it yet, but so to speak, poetry is a special form of knowledge. It's knowledge of our internal world, it's knowledge of the human soul, or whatever subjective experiences we are sharing through poetry. How about I look at some other forms of knowledge, such as the knowledge of the world around us, the external world, so to say. So with that in mind, I ask myself what material tools help us acquire knowledge about the world around us. And they start thinking, and obviously the first things that come to my mind are things like calculators or microscopes or telescopes. Um, I can argue that we we see more distant objects when we use a telescope, and in this sense, a telescope is really important because it enhances our biological uh, senses. But it seems like a trivial point, quite an obvious thing, so I don't really want to make this point. And I try to go further than that, and I start thinking about the biggest telescopes or the most complicated tools of knowledge production ever made. That's just where my thinking takes me. And what comes to mind when I think about big and complicated tools of knowledge production is the Large Hadron Collider, uh, because that's something I, I, I know from the past. It's something passively residing in my background knowledge. I know a little bit about the Large Hadron Collider, but I decided to read a bit more, so I go online and do my research. Uh, I learn or relearn that the Large Hadron Collider is the largest particle accelerator in the world, it is uh, also the largest machine in the world, as a matter of fact, which makes it a good selection of the second object, because being the largest machine in the world, 
seems like a nice background context to it. Uh, the Large Hadron Collider was built by the European Organization for Nuclear Research, CERN. Uh, it took 10 years to build the thing, and more than 100 countries collaborated with the project. It's a massive, uh, impressive project. It lies in a tunnel underground. The tunnel is 27 kilometers in circum circumference, and it lies 175 meters beneath uh, the surface of the Earth, near Geneva, uh, uh, near Geneva beneath the France-Switzerland border. Uh, the purpose of the Large Hadron Collider is to accelerate particles and make them collide. So the idea is that you accelerate particles, you make them collide at a very high speed. And due to the impulse of the collision, they can uh, break if they consist of smaller stuff. They can break apart, and that smaller stuff can uh, fly apart, and you can analyze the trajectory of the pieces. So an analysis of the, of the debris uh, from the collision could help understand what these particles consist of. That's the whole idea of particle accelerators. And one particle in particular that was of special interest when the project was started was the Higgs boson. Uh, there's the so-called standard model in particle physics, uh, where, which claims that there should exist a hypothetical particle called Higgs boson that would explain why all other particles have mass. So without this hypothetical particle, it was uh, difficult or impossible in the standard model of particle physics to explain why particles have mass. The existence of this boson was predicted in 1964. And um, it's interesting because, well, due to the logic of falsification in science, we knew that if the boson does not exist, then chances are the standard model in particle physics is false. And that's a very uh, crucial thing to find out. So obviously scientists were very interested in testing the existence of the Higgs boson. But the problem is that it's not, it's not observable. It's not, it's not easy to see it. It's a subatomic particle, so one needs to uh, collide other particles at a very high speed uh, for the Higgs boson to even show itself. And this is why it was so important to find Higgs boson and to try to design a way that will um, give us a chance to test its, its existence. It was finally found in 2012 in the Large Hadron Collider, and it was a big deal, as you might imagine because that's unprecedented support for the standard model in particle physics. Uh, but what's, important, what's interesting about this whole story is, is what a tremendous effort this was. Decades of work and billions of dollars went into a Large Hadron Collider. And it was all done to test one hypothesis. Well, to be fair, the Collider didn't test one hypothesis only. There were multiple theories tested in the Collider, but this one was, was prominent in many respects. So the knowledge uh, of uh, the Higgs boson would never have been obtained without the use of the Hadron Collider material tools, which kind of supports the claim here. But it also seems like, uh, because the project is so tremendous, and uh, should we wish to collide particles at even a greater speed and analyze even tinier debris, uh, it's becoming next to impossible. It seems like we're reaching the limits of usefulness of material tools. We have to build this enormous machine to test the, the kind of theories that we have now. At some point, probably beyond a certain point, it would no longer be practically possible to test our theories. Our theories will become so uh, niche and uh, so specific that they will they will become untestable because it will be impossible to build a machine that can run that kind of experiment. So I'm thinking maybe that's the kind of point that I will try to make. Uh, that this example shows that material tools are very important indeed, because without the Large Hadron Collider, we wouldn't we wouldn't have we would never have obtained uh, knowledge about the Higgs boson or anything about particle physics for that matter. But the example also shows limitations of material tools. Because it's so enormous, it's hard to imagine that we can build a re an even bigger machine, or even more complicated machine than that. So it seems like there could be thresholds 
in the use of material tools of knowledge production that uh, we will not be able to cross. Um, I decided as my second object, it should say second, not third, to take the Large Hadron Collider and I'm just going to use this image that is uh, uh, in public domain uh, from, from CERN itself. I think this shows the inside of one of the sections of the Large Hadron Collider uh, before the central element was installed. So it shows the eight uh, big magnets that surround the central element of the collider. So uh, the LHC will become my second object. It tests theories in particle physics. It cost a tremendous amount of effort and it took 48 years to confirm the existence of the Higgs boson. That will be my real life, real world context behind the object. How am I going to explain the link? Well, I will say that material tools are very important in obtaining knowledge about the world around us. Without tools like this, we simply don't have the means to get knowledge about particles. However, we seem to be approaching some limit or threshold of what material tools are capable of. And in terms of justification, the exhibition of the object, in terms of justification of the inclusion of the object in my exhibition, uh, it needs to be noted that the object brings out two extra points that I haven't made before. One point is that material tools are really important in knowing the world around us, not just our internal world, so to say. And the second point is that they appear to have the limits. So let's go over to my third object. Uh, continuing the same logic, I want to use something that uh, brings uh, even further arguments into the picture. So I don't want to repeat the things I already said with the inclusion of my object. And note that my first two all obviously linked to knowledge and technology as a theme. So maybe I can keep that in mind and try to uh, keep it consistent. It would be nice if my third one is from knowledge and technology too, although that is not entirely necessary. So far, so far I have said that material tools are very important in producing knowledge about the world. Their power is not endless. They may be important, but at some point it may become impossible to build them. These two points I have made with my second object. I have also said that material tools can even produce knowledge that has been considered inherently human, such as poetry. And this point I'm making with my first object. Um, I could consider swapping the order of the two objects uh, in the commentary that I write, actually. I can start with uh, the second object and then go over to the first object. I will start with the Large Hadron Collider and then I will uh, go over to the AI-generated poem and then I will have this sequence of points to explain in my commentary, which seems a bit more logical. But anyway, let's go over to the third object. As I said, it should add something new to these three points. It should add a particular contribution. Uh, once again, showing an excerpt from the uh, TOK exhibition assessment instrument. Um, I'm thinking about it again, uh, and I realize that so far I have been saying that material tools are important and I have been doing something remotely related to areas of knowledge, such as um, the arts with the IA-generated poem and probably natural sciences with the Large Hadron Collider. So I want to, uh, to, look at, uh, uh, to look at things from a different angle this time, to explore some other perspective or some other dimension of the prompt. And I want to argue that material tools are not important or maybe even harmful. I don't know how yet, but if if that was possible, that would be awesome, uh, because that would add a nice fourth argument to my flow of arguments. I can probably look at everyday knowledge situations as well, personal knowledge, so to say, because so far I have been looking at areas of uh, shared knowledge, such as natural science, something that produces big knowledge communities. So maybe it's time for me to look at uh, knowledge that I have as an individual knower as well in my everyday situations. So start thinking about what kind of technology do we use in our everyday lives. That takes me to thinking about taking pictures and tourists that go somewhere and take pictures. And I think, what if I argue that when you take uh, a picture, when you go somewhere as a tourist and you take 
loads of pictures, you're kind of missing out on the experiences and maybe it deprives you of some important first-hand experiences of the thing. And you are taking pictures instead of living uh, what you are seeing. So maybe I can argue about something on those lines. I do some research online, but um, I hit a dead end because apparently it's not, it's not the case, it's my misconception. There's some research that shows that if you take pictures of uh, the uh, location that you're visiting as a tourist, it actually helps you remember the visual aspect of that situation better. So it's not apparently that simple, and it just uncover one of the misconceptions I had. So I abandoned that idea with photography, but while I was researching stuff like negative impacts of photography, it brought up some articles related to selfies. It's a huge deal how people have become obsessed with selfies and it has had a bunch of detrimental effects. So I decided to explore this a bit further. It's kind of an unexpected direction for me, but I still do a bit of reading. And one article in particular catches my eye. The article argues that selfies distort the proportions of our face, that they make our nose appear 30% larger than it actually is. And the article argues that my selfie, when I take it close to my, to my face due to the way the camera, the lens in the camera is constructed, that my selfie dis distorts the face and I, I, I don't actually look like what I see in my own selfie. I start researching further and reading this article and I find out that plastic surgeons have been reporting a sharp increase in the number of patients who want to go through surgery uh, well, mostly to do a nose job, because they don't like the way they look in selfies. Most of these patients, uh, as research shows, don't realize that selfies distort their face. They believe that's what they look like. They believe that that's how big their nose is. Uh, and plastic surgeons even started using special software that reverses the distortion and returns normal proportions to the selfie, in an attempt to prevent people from making surgery decisions that they would later regret. Psychologists have even invented a term for this condition, Snapchat dysmorphia. Uh, and it all started with an article published in uh, the Journal of a Medical, the Journal of American Medical Association, Facial Plastic Surgery. Uh, the name of the article you can see on the screen. And I'm thinking maybe I can include this a screenshot of that article as my third object. So it's Ward's article, Nasal, Nasal Distortion in Short Distance Photographs, the Selfie Effect. It's the article that discovered, the article that describes the research that discovered the selfie effect in, in 2018. Uh, and there we go. My third object will be Ward's article in the Facial Plastic Surgery Journal. The real-world context is that the article reflects the concern that selfies distort the face, that patients don't realize it and therefore they seek plastic surgery. My link to the prompt will be that material tools such as cameras are indeed important and they do play a big role in our lives, but we need to remember that in certain ways they can also distort our knowledge and produce some negative consequences. And we should be aware of these distortions which it seems we're not right now. And finally, how will I justify the inclusion of the object in my exhibition? Well, I said previously that material tools are important, but they have a limit. Uh, that was with my large uh, Hadron Collider example. I said previously that uh, material tools are so important that they are taking over human territory. That was my AI-generated poem example. And with this particular object, they seem to be saying that material tools can also be harmful, so we need to be aware. This seems like a nice addition to the flow of arguments, so I'm pretty satisfied at this point. So looking back, this is a collection of my objects. As you can see, two of them are digital, uh, a screenshot of the abstract of the article published in the Journal of Facial Plastic Surgery, and a screenshot from a website uh, containing an AI-generated poem. It is allowed to have digital objects like that as long as they have a specific real-world context behind them. So to look back at the thinking process that was involved in this particular exhibition sample, 
uh, I started with uh, some examples that were considered in class, and then I just went along the road of free search. Uh, I think, uh, on reflection, it has been the easiest way to find the first object so far, uh, one, as compared to my first two uh, exhibition samples. I'm just using an object that has been discussed in class, and I'm just drawing inspiration from that object. The trick was to select an object and to just uh, set my mind on it, to not think any further, just focus on that object and research around it. I think it really worked. Uh, I used one lesson, I picked an object that was discussed in that lesson, the AI-generated chapter of Harry Potter. Then I explored other similar objects. I found one I liked, that was the AI poem. Then I chose the IA prompt uh, that is most suitable to this object, and I formulated the link. And from the link, I started thinking about what extra dimensions of the prompt I can explore. And that particular reasoning guided my search for the other two objects. So I think from this point on, I started using the top-down approach again. Uh, but I feel like it really works for me to ensure that the three uh, objects um, can be nicely, uh, the inclusion of the three objects can be nicely justified uh, in the commentary. Uh, my source of inspiration has been the, the uh, textbook lessons. Uh, luckily, the book is full of cool examples. Uh, we have examples in each and every lesson that is designed to be used in class. We also have the special exhibition sections at the start of every unit. And after every unit, we'll come back to the exhibition and analyze it on a new level, incorporating all the new concepts that have been learned. or have the back to exhibition section there. Um, let's mark what I have got so far. Um, as you remember, I'm interested to know what could potentially go wrong, and what criticism I can expect from examiners. Uh, I do think that I did a decent job again, but I also want to know if there's anything that can potentially be identified as a weakness. And, uh, yeah. The common questions that I ask myself are, could it be that the context behind my objects is not, is not specific enough? Could they say that my objects are not linked well enough to the prompt? Could they say that the inclusion of my objects in the exhibition is not justified well enough? And could they say that my exhibition is not based on one of the themes? Uh, well, let's go through these potential objections one by one. So could it be that the context behind my objects is not specific enough? Well, if you look at the collider, it does have a whole story behind it. It's not just a generic particle accelerator. It's one of its kind, the largest machine in the world, and the one uh, whose design was heavily associated with uh, the search for the Higgs boson. It was instrumental in supporting the standard model, standard model of particle physics. So it did play a tremendous role in particle physics. So it does have a rich context behind it. The IA-generated poem is also not just one of many poems that it could have found online. I did not pick it randomly. It was taken from a website. It has some personal context behind it. It was taken from a website that I took uh, to see if the, if the computer can fool me, uh, trick me into believing that certain poems were written by human beings. And it totally could. So the poem, this particular poem, is an example of a poem that fooled me in the Turing test and struck me as very human-like. So I thought it was written by a human being, but I was surprised to find out that it wasn't. That's the personal context behind this uh, object. And finally, the journal article, its context is that it was the first research to show that selfies can distort our faith. This was quite eye-opening evidence, uh, and it may have changed uh, the, the practice of plastic surgery in many ways. It uncovered that people commonly seek plastic surgery for very wrong reasons. Uh, again, it's not just one of the articles about the selfie effect. It's the first article ever published that um, established the existence of the selfie effect as such. Let's go, go over to the second thing. Uh, could they say that my objects are not linked well enough to the prompt? Uh, well, the important words in the prompt were uh, material tools, important, and production slash acquisition of knowledge. 
the collider is a material tool. Uh, I don't think we can doubt that. It's the biggest material tool ever produced. It is used for production of knowledge because that's we as humanity produce knowledge about uh, particles. So in this way, the collider it seems to be linked to the prompt. The poem is also the creation of a material tool of an AI computer algorithm. Uh, if poetry is knowledge, then apparently it can be produced by a material tool. And if that is so, it makes material tools extremely important in the production of this kind of knowledge. That's how I link the poem to the prompt. I do see one weakness here. Uh, the weak link here is, is the suggestion that poetry is a kind of knowledge. Is it? Some people argue that knowledge is not contained in the poem itself. It, it may be contained in, the, in how the audience perceives the poem, or it may be even contained in the intentions of the artist, the poet, who created the poem. There are different viewpoints here, but I feel like because there are different viewpoints and no correct answer, I'm also quite justified in assuming that a poem can be treated as a form of knowledge. Um, and finally, the article explains how cameras, which are undoubtedly material tools, distort our everyday knowledge, uh, such as the image of the self, so they do uh, affect the acquisition of knowledge about ourselves. Uh, it seems to me that everything is pretty well linked to the prompt here, perhaps except for the poem, which is a bit tricky. Uh, I don't think it can be marked down for, uh, for suggesting that a poem is a form of knowledge. Uh, in the context of this particular exhibition, but do let me know if you think otherwise. Uh, how do I justify the inclusion? Well, I've said a lot about that in this um, presentation already. The approach I have taken to justifying the inclusion is to explain what unique contribution each of the objects makes. And I'm using the language of the TOK exhibition assessment instrument here. The collider demonstrates that material tools are important in obtaining knowledge about the world, but it also demonstrates that we may be approaching the limits of their usefulness. The poem demonstrates that material tools can even take over knowledge territory that traditionally belonged exclusively to humans, such as poetry, knowledge of our own inner worlds, inner soul. Uh, and the article demonstrates that our everyday knowledge can be negatively impacted by the use of material tools. I feel like the first and the third here are pretty straightforward, and the second one is a little bit more of a stretch. I feel like it will still work because the link is justified and the inclusion is justified. Um, but do let me know if you think otherwise, if you think that the AI generated poem is actually a weak object in this context. It seems to tick the box in the assessment instrument that says there is a strong justification of the particular contribution that each individual object makes to the exhibition. And finally, the themes. Can they say that my exhibition is not based on one of the themes? As you know, there's a strong recommendation that the IB makes that exhibitions should be based on one of the themes. The IB has also clarified that the purpose of this recommendation is not to, is to, it's just to make the object selection process easier for the students. And they have clarified that if objects are not based on a theme, students will not be penalized for that. Uh, in, the, in my previous two exhibition samples, I didn't worry too much about the themes, as you might have seen, but in this one I decided to stick to a theme if possible. Uh, I feel like I have succeeded, and all my three objects are linked to knowledge and technology, but again, it's, it's not a big deal. Uh, the IB says that uh, starting with a particular theme may make uh, object selection easier. In my own experience, I found that uh, it really doesn't. Uh, what does make object selection easier is choosing one particular lesson or one particular topic within a unit that I have studied. So it so happened that the lesson that it picked for this uh, exhibition sample belonged to the unit knowledge and technology, but I feel like it could have belonged to any other unit as well. So starting with that particular lesson and with the concept and with the object investigated in that lesson, it gave me a good starting point to look for other objects. And uh, as I mentioned already, I feel like in this third exhibition sample, the selection of the first object might have been the easiest uh, so far, at least in my experience.
Uh, in this exhibition, I followed the recommendation. Yeah, I've said all that already. And finally, um, as usual, I invite you to give my exhibition a mark and to justify it. I'm open to opinions and I'm, I'm interested in various perspectives because we're all in the same boat. We're trying to decipher the IB assessment criteria. This is a new syllabus and I'm sure that our understanding will be crystallized as we're going on. Thank you for watching and see you next time.